We're on the third segment of the Principles of Manual Muscle Testing lecture, and we're going to be talking about grading and the procedure to actually perform the muscle testing. We've talked about some elements of procedure. We've talked about how to, the concepts related to positioning the, the patient and applying the pressure. And at this point, again, we're going to go on to grading and, and the full procedure. You can see here the, the scale or the table for the muscle grading, and this is out of the Kendall book. And actually what I want to do is direct your attention kind of to the right side where the numbers are, the far right column. And those are the numbers that we're going to be using for grading. We also need to know the letters and the names because sometimes just when people are talking they'll say, oh, they graded their muscle strength was poor. And so poor actually has a really precise definition. It, just, it doesn't mean what we would think of in common parlance as poor. The same with fair or good those actually have precise definitions. So that's really part of the reason I think it's better to use the numbers because even if you don't understand or don't know the scale for muscle testing, if somebody tells you on a scale of 0 to 5 you're a 3, everybody has a kind of a sense of what that means. Or if another profession, nursing for example, is reading the muscle testing results, it's a lot easier to interpret what a 3 out of 5 is than what a fair minus might be. The other reason to use the, mu the numbers is that it would lend itself better to writing goals and looking at a percentage of muscle increase, percentage of muscle strength increase. So again, we're going to use the numbers, but you do need to know what the names mean. We're going to start actually at the number 3. So go ahead and find that on the chart. And you can see that the definition means that they can hold the test position, and on the far left, it says tests in the anti-gravity position. Anti-gravity means against gravity. So what you've done is you've chosen the proper body position, prone, supine, sideline, and then you've placed the limb into the test position, which we'll be sharing with you, so that the muscle has to hold the weight of the limb against gravity. If the person can do that, they get a 3. And the result of that activity determines whether you go up on the scale and add resistance or whether you go down on the scale and put them into the gravity eliminated or horizontal plane position. So let's say that we've put them into the test position and they can hold the weight of their limb against gravity. Let's pretend we're using the biceps, doing the biceps. So what I would like you to do, you're all sitting probably, just put your elbow in 90 degrees and see if you can hold the weight of your forearm and hand against gravity. I bet you all can. So you all get at least a 3, but that doesn't really represent the full strength of your muscle. So then what we would do is if we were doing this with a patient, is we would place our hand on the palmar aspect of their forearm and we would ask them to hold against our resistance. In other words, we want to create an isometric contraction. And it's really important to understand that all of the testing that we're going to do is going to be isometric contractions. So we are not asking the person to concentrically move into the position, into the test position. We're going to place their limb into the test position and then gradually release our support and see if they can hold it. Only then will we add ex external pressure if they can hold their limb against gravity. So isometrically, you're holding your forearm against gravity, and then with your other hand, go ahead and place resistance on top of that. And as you look on the scale, you can see if you could take slight pressure, you could get a 3 plus. Slight to moderate pressure, you'd get a 4 minus. If you could hold that test position against moderate pressure, you'd get a 4. If you could hold it against moderate to strong pressure, you'd get a 4 plus. And finally, the highest grade, if you could hold the test position against strong pressure, you get a 5. Now I know this begs the question of what's strong pressure, what's moderate pressure. And this is what we just have to work on in lab. This is one of those tactile skills you have to develop. It's important though that we start here and you understand the procedure and you understand the definitions of the different grades. So let's pretend that when you were placed, your elbow was placed into that 90 degree position, that you couldn't hold 
your forearm up against gravity. Your muscle wasn't strong enough, so it just kind of dropped. Then as an examiner, what we would do is to either turn the patient's body or turn the limb so that, in this case, elbow flexion could occur in the horizontal plane. We call that gravity eliminated. So see if you can figure out what position can you put your arm in so that you're flexing your elbow in the horizontal plane. Go ahead and pause the presentation for a second if you need to do that. So what you should be doing right now is your arm, your, your shoulder should be up in flexion, 90 degrees of flexion, and then you can flex your elbow coming toward your face, bringing your hand toward your face. That would be the horizontal plane. Now if you were doing this with a patient, you would be supporting their forearm. You don't want them to have to hold their the rest of their body weight. So you'd support their arm. Um, so definitely support under the elbow, put slight support under the under the wrist and hand, and then ask them to see if they could start at zero degrees of elbow extension and flex their elbow through full range of motion. So there's a big difference between testing in the horizontal plane and testing against gravity. Against gravity we use an isometric contraction, but when we're testing weaker muscles in the horizontal plane, we use concentric contractions. And you can see the grading. If they can move through complete range of motion from zero degrees of elbow extension to full elbow flexion, for the case of the biceps, then they would get a grade of two. If they can only th move through part of that range of motion, they would get a two minus. And it doesn't matter if they can move through 10 degrees or 40 degrees or 100 degrees. If they can't complete full range of motion, then they still get a two minus. Now if they can move through the complete motion and take some pressure, then you would give them a two plus. And it doesn't really matter where you apply that pressure. They could, you know, somewhere in the middle of the range, 90 degrees of flexion in the case of the biceps, full flexion, it doesn't really matter. You can also give them some slight pressure through the motion. So this is much less precise. But the concept is that they can go through full range of motion without any resistance, and then you add some resistance at some point in the range or through the range. So then they would get a two plus. You can see that another way to give them a 2 plus is if they can move through part of the range motion against gravity. Um, I'm going to wait and explain that more in lab, so I don't want you to think about that too much right now. So, so far, I know this is a little confusing. So far what we have is that we've tried to put the person in the against gravity, the anti-gravity test position, and they either could or could not hold that. That's our three so we're first of all deciding if they can get a three. If they can hold it, we give them resistance and we would go somewhere, their grade is going to be somewhere between a three and a five. If they can't hold the test position against gravity, then we put them in gravity eliminated and see if they can go through the full range of motion. If they can, then they get a two. And, they, and if we can add resistance, they get a two plus. If they can't go through the full range, but they can go through partial range, they get a two minus. Finally, sometimes muscles are very weak and you are able to either palpate or visualize a contraction, but there's the muscle's not strong enough to move the weight of the limb or to, to move the limb at all. And that person would get a one. And I think the word trace in that case is meaningful. I think that intuitively tells you that there's some trace or some slight activity going on. Lastly, if the person is not able to contract the muscle at all, you can't feel or visualize any movement, then that would be a zero. I don't want you to get too overwhelmed. It's too early to panic about this testing or this grading scale. Remember, you're starting at three with your against gravity position. Then you either go up or down based on that. We will work as I mentioned in lab, to help you feel comfortable with what, what moderate pressure is, what strong pressure is, and on the checkoff and in the testing, you only have to get within half a grade, which gives us quite a bit of leeway. So if 
the faculty member thinks that the person is exhibiting a s muscle with a strength of 4, you then could grade it as either a 4 minus 4 or a 4 plus and still pass. I want to go on at this point and talk about the concept of muscle substitutions. And if you just think about the word substitute, you know that that means to to use one thing in the in the case of instead of another. And that's really exactly what's happening here. There are different types of substitutions that we're going to go through, but essentially in general, if someone substitutes one muscle for another, they're using one muscle to do the work of another. So for example, if you're trying to test in this case Let's let's look at the uh, notes on page four. If you look at B, for example, let's say that you're trying to test the muscles that would hold the glenohumeral joint in abduction. Any idea what that muscle would be? Right, the deltoid. So let's put your put your shoulder, your glenohumeral joint, into 90 degrees of abduction and just hold it there. So if you can just hold it, at least, what's the least grade that you get? You're against gravity and you're holding the test position. Right, you get a 3. So let's say that, though, you really can't do that. And so can you think of another way that you can try to keep your forearm or your upper arm up in that position? You might be kind of hiking your shoulder up a little bit, elevating, shrugging your shoulder. That's more the use of upper trapezius. So that would be an example of a substitution. Somebody who can't really hold a test position and so they try to use some other muscles around that, that area or that joint to create that motion. Another example of a substitution, if we go up to A on your notes, is when you have a muscle that's compensating or trying to activate in the place of a paralyzed or absent muscle. And this is going to be, again, hard for me to demonstrate or to explain without being able to demonstrate it. But what I want you to do is when you're sitting there, put your arm, put your hand flat on the table. And so your um, elbow will be in 90 degrees of flexion and your shoulder should be in about 90 degrees of abduction. And what I want you to do is to try to think about straightening your elbow without using your triceps. If you put the heel of your hand on your sternum, the heel of your right hand on your sternum, assuming your left hand is on the table, and put your fingers out toward your shoulder, kind of going along your pectoralis major muscle fibers. Now curl your fingers, your, the fingers of your right hand, as if you're pulling on those muscle fibers. And can you see that that would pull the humerus toward your body and passively straighten your elbow? Don't worry if you can't see it. I'll demonstrate it. But that's an example of using reverse action of the pectoralis major, the arms in the closed pack I'm sorry, the closed chain position. We're doing closed chain elbow extension. And this is actually how people with spinal cord injuries who don't have triceps can straighten and stabilize their elbows. The third type of substitution is listed on C on your notes, and this is going to be a lot easier to explain without a demonstration. We know and understand the concepts of synergistic muscles. There are muscles which can perform the same actions. And so even if we're trying to test, for example, the hip flexors, we can look at the quality of the motion and see if one hip flexor is dominating over another. And the example I've given you is, let's say that we're trying to test the iliopsoas and we're seeing that the iliopsoas isn't working as much, but we tend to see a lot of external rotation along with our hip flexion. That could mean that the sartorius is dominating. Sometimes the tensor fasciolata can become overdeveloped and very tight for abduction. And so sometimes we'll see the tensor fasciolata dominating and we'll see internal rotation during hip abduction instead of more neutral hip abduction that would be created with a gluteus medius. So these are kind of subtle, but we definitely can see the role of synergists with substitutions. Finally, again, a common one that we see is the person moving their body to get in a position where they can use muscles that are actually stronger. And the one I've listed as an example is very common. Let's say that the person is sidelined 
you abduct the hip to test the gluteus medius, and when you ask them to hold that position, they externally rotate their, their hip. And really what they're doing is they're placing their hip in a position, or their femur in a position where the hip flexors can help out a little bit. Can you picture that if you're sidelining, if you externally rotate the hip, it puts the hip flexors kind of on top of the hip now, and it's a lot easier for them to help hold that position. Now this is probably a little confusing at this point, at this stage in the game, and you are not going to have to try to come up with or invent these substitutions. When you look in your book, in your Kendall book, and it, in the pages where it describes the muscle testing, at the end of the description, and I really encourage you to read all those words. Don't just focus on the picture and the procedure, but read through the whole explanation, and generally toward the bottom, it will give examples if substitutions are a possibility for a particular muscle, it will explain what the substitution is and what it looks like. So I'm not going to ask you to come up with anything on your own. So let's wrap up and just look at the muscle procedure. Let's look, try to put all this information together and describe the, what the procedure would look like. So we know that we want to expose the muscle to pr that we're going to be testing because we need to be able to visually identify it in the case of a weak muscle to make sure that it's contracting. We want to ensure that the correct muscle is contracting even if it's not weak. And we need it in a position where we can palpate again to verify m activation of the correct muscle. So we've exposed the muscle. We need to decide again the body position. So we would put the person in the correct body position, prone, supine, side lying, sitting, and then expose that muscle. Then we need to place the patient's limb into the anti-gravity test position. In other words, remember, we are placing the limb. You're going to see when you test some of those muscles that there needs to be a combination of motions. So for example, when we test the gluteus medius, the person will be side lying. Their leg, their entire lower extremity needs to be in alignment with their trunk so they can't, their, their legs can't, their top leg can't be in flexion. We need to be abducting truly in the, in the frontal plane with slight external rotation. So if we tried to tell the person how to do all that and then made them concentrically do it, it would be really difficult for get them to get into the precise position. So we will place them precisely into the position we want them at our stabilization with our hands, and then once they're there, we gradually, gradually release our support and see if they can hold the test position against gravity. And if they can, again, what do they get for a grade? A three, at least a three. If they can hold it, then we apply gradually apply resistance. Now we don't want to do this really hard and fast. We want to give them time to accommodate to the resistance and kind of figure out what they're supposed to do and, and in order to hold that muscle. So and it also applying it gradually gives us a chance to grade it. So we can kind of gradually apply, okay, slight, slight to moderate, moderate, moderate to strong, and strong. So it gives us a, you know, a second or two to apply that pressure, and so we give them a chance to accommodate to it. We give ourselves a chance to feel the amount of force that they're able to resist. If we can do that, then we figure out our grade. Let's go back, though. Let's say they couldn't hold the test position. Then we would figure out how to position them so they could go through the horizontal plane. So let me ask you. You can pause the tape after I ask my question if you want to think about it. If you were testing the hip abductors, gluteus medius, and the person could not hold the anti-gravity test position, how would you position them so that you could activate the hip abductors in the horizontal plane? So pause and think about that until you have an answer. So what you should have come up with is that you could put the person supine and then hip abduction would take place in the horizontal plane. So that's the place we would put them, and we would just put our hand under the heel and maybe under the calf, and take the friction off so that they could abduct concentrically. We'd start them in neutral, in the anatomical position, and we'd say, okay, we'd passively move them through the motion first to show them what to do, and so that we knew what the full motion was, and we'd say, okay, now this is what I want you to do. Move your leg out against to the side. Bring them back in and say, okay, can you do that? And then see if they can move their 
leg out through that full range. That's another reason to take them passively through the range because you need to know the full range to know if they've gone through the full range. So then they go through the full range. You say, okay, good, that was good. If they were able to go through the full range, they would get at least what grade? A two. If they could do that, then you could do it again, either applying some resistance while they're doing it or having them abduct and then applying the resistance afterwards isometrically. Either way is fine. And if they could do that, they would get a 2 plus. Good. And if they could only go through partial range of motion, what grade would they get? 2 minus. All right, so then we would determine and record that grade. So that's the procedure. And hopefully this makes sense to you. I know it's very difficult to imagine this procedure without seeing it. So rest assured, we're going to be doing this in lab, and you're going to have a lot of opportunity to practice and to get feedback and to see demonstrations. I want to end with uh, showing you a picture of Florence Kendall on her 90th birthday. And I was very excited and happy to be able to attend that birthday party with her and, you know, of course, millions of her other friends. But that's me and Florence, or Florence and I. So I'm pretty excited and happy to show you that picture. Hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I'll be looking forward to your feedback on how we can make subsequent presentations like this more effective and beneficial for you and I look forward to practicing muscle testing with you in lab. Thanks and have a great day.